Okay, our next presentation will be from uh, Andrea Fritoli. He is an open source developer advocate at IBM, and uh, he will tell us about his experience uh, using machine learning for continuous integration. Thank Please, you. Thank go. you for the introduction. So welcome everyone. Um, so yeah, my name is Andrea Frittoli. Um, so I'll present today a work we've done with a couple of colleagues, uh, so Matt Trinish and Kira Wulfert. Um, so we, the idea is that we wanted to really uh, learn more about machine learning. And with open source, there are a lot of open source tools um, uh, for machine learning. So there's a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, books you can find, and you have very powerful tools uh, at your disposal. So we thought, okay, let's, let's uh, make uh, something that is interesting to us and let's apply machine learning to it. We have, we, uh, have been working with the open so, uh, OpenStack community and um, there is a very large scale CI, uh, CI system there. So because the tools are kind of there, the open source tools, but what is hard to find is an open source data set, if you will. And you really need a good data set if you want to do something meaningful and it's, it's hard to get good quality data. Uh, but because uh, we have this CI system in, open, in OpenStack and, and all the logs, everything is available publicly. So we thought, well, um, let's um, look at this uh, data that we get from CI. So here we are showing in million of uh, tests. You see it's uh, one LA, for 10 LA, uh, uh, power to seven. So it's the number of tests that run daily and this is a graph I got it updated until the beginning of March. And so we do continuous integration, continuous, continuously log data there in OpenStack. So we have lots of data. And, and one of the problem in the community there has always been uh, to have enough engineers to triage all the failures and understand everything that is going on there. Um, so we thought, well, we might use AI to try and, and solve this problem and help us as human scale better. Um, as you know, in open source community, you may have a limited amount of engineers and they may have a limited amount of time that they can dedicate to the project. So it's, we thought, okay, maybe AI can help us here looking at this log files from, from CI and understanding what is going on. So what we do there um, for OpenStack is um, integration testing in a virtual machines. So, um, Every time a patch is submitted to OpenStack, OpenStack, uh, uh, if you don't know, it's a cloud management system. So it allows you to uh, manage its cloud and network, virtual networks and storage and so forth. Um, so we have uh, public cloud donors that donate resources to the OpenStack project so we can sp spin up VMs. And if every time you want to run tests, so we spin up a VMs, we install the entire OpenStack on top of this virtual machine and then we run end-to-end -end tests, so which means we actually create virtual machines, storage, networks, and so forth in the VM. And all these generate loads on the virtual machine. Uh, so, and we gather then system logs, we gather application logs, and we also gather what, um, the logs that are produced by uh, a tool which is called DSTAT that allows you to uh, store in kind of CSV type format information about uh, key statistics of your operating system, like the CPU utilization, the disk IO, the memory utilization, the average load uh, on a minute or five minutes and so forth. So there are a la large number of statistics and we get this data uh, from, uh, for all the CI jobs, the, the million of tests that are run daily. So we thought we could use the DSTA data because this is numeric numerical data as well, so it, may, it will make, hello, yeah. It will make life a little bit easier in terms of normalization. And it's also interesting because um, the, we get this data running test on OpenStack, but it's not necessarily OpenStack specific uh, because um, it can, the same kind of uh, uh, system, machine learning model, you could be applied to any distant data generated in any kind of use case. <coughs> Sorry about that. So um, one of the things that we recognized um, in the beginning, maybe a bit late, um, is that, yeah, so you need data, actually, if you want to do something, as I was saying in the beginning. So 
even if you're not sure exactly what kind of machine learning model you're going to use and you're still considering things, if you have a chance if you, uh, to have data to start collecting it, do it as soon as possible because the more data you will be able to, to gather, the better it will be the outcome for your machine learning work. So what we have done, um, because the, the storage space from the CI system and OpenStack side has limited space and they regularly clean up the logs there. So we set up a system that regularly fetches the logs that are interesting to us and stores them in a, um, as raw data in a, as free storage. We use a, a function that is run as a periodically, so a couple of times a day, I think, and we just get the, the latest logs and we store them in S3. So, um, we built um, an application that let us um, create uh, what we call a, a data set, which is a a normalized data set that is taken out of the, the raw data that we, we created. So uh, one of the first, uh, actually the first step uh, before you, you dive into writing Python code or doing things is actually to explore your data and try to visualize it if possible. If there are multiple dimensions, you may try to cut it in some way or to you know, uh, aggregate it in some format so that you, you can find um, where there is more information in your data. Sometimes you have a lot of redundancy, like if you look at the system um, uh, performance, like the different indicators, uh, like in our case, you may see that the graph for uh, the CPU matches very much the graph of the average load, for instance, and then is, well, maybe using both of them it's redundant because it's the same kind of information. And because the more information you have, the more processing you have to do. So it's better to try and you know, get rid of the information that is not relevant. So gather a lot of data first and then, but then focus on the one that is actually relevant for your model. This is an example. Uh, it's a Python uh, tool. Uh, we call it CIMO, CI and machine learning, uh, CI machine learning, uh, that allows us to, from the raw data set, to select a number of features uh, so that we can have uh, a repeat, uh, we can have a, we have a tool, a way to, from the raw data that we collected over time, to extract a data set that we know um, as a specific format. So we do two things. We filter it, so we filter in terms of uh, features uh, that we select. We want to use the CPU or the memory. And then we select the size uh, of the data set, and we do normalization. Normalization, um, because this is numeric already, means mostly that uh, we want to make sure that the, the numbers are between minus one and one because it makes a computation much less CPU intensive, if you will. So this is an example of how the DSTAT data looks like. As I said, it's a kind of CSV. Uh, so it's a big table and you have uh, timestamps and for every timestamp you have a lot of columns. So what we do here, we do a selection of which columns that are interesting for us. So this is the uh, uh, CPU utilization for user uh, space, and this is the average load uh, over one minute system load. And then we also do downsampling because we have this data for every second. And uh, we realize, and I will get in more details about this later, that you don't really actually need uh, that kind of granularity. So you may uh, get good results with a lower granularity. And then we do data normalization uh, because we have a, a matrix as a result of the filtering we've done before. But this matrix is actually one sample for us because it's a result of one CI test. So we want to do uh, unrolling, which means that this matrix actually becomes a vector, a long vector of uh, numbers and normalization. So this is a, a sample of unrolled data. So you see uh, the CPU uh, that was here this three values, 6, 1, 1, 7, 5, 1, 2, 6, become actually three different columns, USR1, USR2, USR3. So we have this for every uh, instant in time that we, um, that we selected. And these li lines now, they correspond to different samples. So this is a CI job 1, CI job 2, and CI job 3. Hope this makes it a bit more clear. And you see the numbers, they have random values. And after normalization, they all uh, belong between minus 1 and 1. 
Another thing that you, uh, you may want to take care of when you build the data set uh, is uh, do not use everything for training. It's important to train your model, but it's also important to have an evaluation phase where you test the, how, how accurate is your model in predicting the things that you want to predict. And you may also want to have a small uh, dev uh, data set that you can use for fine tuning the hyperparameters of your, of your model. Again, all this, uh, the data set, oh, uh, sorry. One, something I wanted to mention is that the, the labels term there is, labels is a bit overloaded as a word. Um, in there, we just need, need the name of the, of the features uh, that we have, like this USR1, USR2 there. Um, so, and this is the data and the classes is actually um, the values of the things that we want to predict. I'll get in more details about that in a moment. Data sets are also stored in uh, S3 storage. The next thing is uh, that we wanted to do is to be able to define an experiment. Um, so again, we have a tool written in Python that we created that allows us to uh, define the hyperparameter of an experiment and store them in a, in a format so that we can rerun experiments uh, in a repeatable way. So we have a, a data set that we can recreate uh, uh, and then we can run experiments so there are multiple hyperparameters. We can select uh, how, what is the structure of the a neural network, for instance, how many hidden layers, how many neuron per layers, how many steps, and so forth. And then uh, we have a wrapper command to, that allows us a CIML, CIML train model that allows us to, to actually run the training. So the reason we, we did the split, uh, the separation in different steps, so normalization, preparation of the data, uh, normalization, and then training is that in, in our experience here, we use TensorFlow as a model, and TensorFlow uh, has tools and APIs that allows you to do data normalization. But we wanted to do that uh, directly with Python tools, because um, when we started, we didn't know for sure whether we wanted to stick with TensorFlow, or maybe switch to other different frameworks. So we wanted to be able to normalize our data and get it to a clean state that then we could use to feed to any kind of machine learning framework that we wanted to use. So um, we are able to run the training on your laptop locally with this, but we also integrated uh, this with uh, FIDL, F FDL, which is an open source um, project by um, mainly contribution by IBM. And that basically allows you to uh, take a model and uh, do the training, distribute the training on a Kubernetes cluster. So this is a bit more about the training infrastructure. This is the, the picture is the architecture of FIDL itself. Uh, I will not get into details of that. Um, we use the estimator API in TensorFlow, uh, which is actually based on Keras, which is another open source library, which allows very um, high level of abstraction when you, it's very good if you want to start uh, defining models, very simple. So we created the CML wrapper, which is Python script that invoke uh, the TensorFlow API and do uh, the training, run the training, do the normalization, the preparation of experiments. So as I was saying, the, the machine learning framework is interchangeable and the training options is local or we, we can also, we have a Helm chart to deploy our application, so then running container or we can use Fiddle. So for the prediction side, um, the model that we have in mind uh, that we implemented here is event-driven. So uh, because we have uh, CI jobs that are executed, uh, the event that are generated is when a CI job is completed, then new uh, data is generated and we want to run inference on that data. So based on the model that we were trained. So we don't have a request for a, a inference based on that model, but we have an event that is triggered. Because of that, we have uh, written a, uh, a Kubernetes application that basically <coughs> includes an MQTT client. OpenStack CI system generates MQTT events when jobs are completed. So we can listen to these events, download the logs, um, and then run inference and predict the parameters that we want to predict on that. Because um, the CI job from OpenStack is considered for us a trusted source of data, uh, we can use the new data that comes in as well to uh, continue training uh, the model. 
with new data. Okay, so this is all about the kind of infrastructure and how we structure the project. So I, I will get a bit more now in details uh, what kind of inference we've done, what, what kind of training. Um, so we've done two main uh, type of um, experiments. The first one is a binary classification. Basically, we want to predict very simply if the tests are passed or failed. So we've seen enough logs over the years and we thought, well, Let's make a bet. I think just looking at the system load, we are able to predict whether a test was passed or failed. So let's build a model and see if we are able to predict that. So it's a supervised training because we actually know whether the test is passed or failed. Um, we use the DNN classifier with two classes from uh, TensorFlow. Uh, we, we picked a specific CI job, which is called Tempestful. Um, in OpenStack, there are uh, two, there are several, but two main, um, CI pipeline, one is the test uh, check pipeline, which is executed when the code is initially submitted to the project uh, before it's actually reviewed by developers. So there is a lot of variability in there and we didn't want to use that data because we didn't want to try and predict failures that are uh, due to a typo in the code or something like that. Um, instead, we took data from the gate pipeline. So the gate pipeline is executed on code that's been tested already by the automatic system, has been reviewed by uh, the contributors and has been approved. So just before the code is merged, the tests are executed again, and this is the gate pipeline and it's clean data and the failures are related maybe to infrastructure issues and maybe mm, some new version of a library that is released and is pulled in uh, in the test and it fails, so maybe there is a race condition uh, so that it was not picked up during the, the check testing and so forth. Uh, we have 3,000 examples and we split them in uh, uh, 2,100 for training and 900 for test. In terms of hyperparameter, we use kind of the standard settings, the, the real activation function for the output layer sigmoid, which worked very well with the binary classification. Um, default optimi optimizer again, so the adaptive gradient descent. Um, it's a good one because basically it's adaptive. So it doesn't really matter the learning rate, the initial learning rate that you set because it will adapt itself and select uh, a good value for that. And uh, so it's a neural network. We have, uh, we started with five hidden layers and 100 um, units per layer. And we uh, run 500 epochs, which means that we go 500 times over the, our input. So we have uh, 2,100 uh, samples for, for training. So we repeat that 500 times. And then uh, we use an input function that randomizes the order to make it more effective. So then we run a different, exam, different uh, test. So our main, um, sorry, a key um, metric is accuracy that we looked at and we tried different combination of features. So for instance, using, just looking at the CPU, just looking at the memory or the average load or combination of different feature, features from the distant data. And we saw that in terms of accuracy, uh, the combination of uh, CPU and uh, average system load was the, the, the most uh, effective one. So this looks a bit uh, the other way around uh, because accuracy, the better, the closer to one, the better, right? So um, all these tests that we did, they, they had reasonable accuracy, uh, but they were close enough that if you would display them with bars they, from between zero and one, you wouldn't notice the difference enough. So we actually displayed one minus the accuracy so that you can appreciate the difference in accuracy between the different experiments. We also looked at the loss. Uh, the loss was slightly worse in this case, but still uh, acceptable and not very much different from the other one, so. And with this, we achieved an accuracy of 0 0.992, which is pretty good, we think. It's pretty reasonable. Um, on a 900, uh, evaluation set, it means about seven mistakes, which is pretty good. Um, another thing that we wanted to see if it's how, um, how well this uh, training model could work with um, CI, a different CI job. So there are several CI jobs that are executed for OpenStack and for each
we run end-to-end -end test, which is a Tempest full job, and then there is a Python 3 version of that, which is very similar, but slightly different because one of the components, Swift, uh, doesn't support Python 3. Um, so those tests are not executed, and that service is not run running, which affects the overall uh, system uh, uh, metrics. Sorry. So what we did, train the model uh, with the Tempest full um, data set, and we <coughs> ran the evaluation of the Tempest pool Pi 3. So, and, and the result was kind of okay, so the accuracy went down to from 0.994 to 0.953, which is still re reasonable, uh, but the um, loss doubled, and the um, precision against recall area, it's much worse, which means that it may mean that uh, our data on the LSCI job uh, maybe was too biased, or maybe there was a little bit of overfitting that was happening there. So to summarize, for the binary classification, we found that um, with 10 seconds uh, sampling um, is the best, but one minute may be enough, uh, that we can get a very good accuracy and a very good uh, precision versus recall um, curve. The graph on the right, and s on the right side is um, the training loss. While the training is done, so it, it goes down smoothly and it's uh, pretty consistent, so. The second experiment uh, is a multi-class type of classification that we did. As I was saying in the beginning, uh, the VMs are donated by different cloud providers around the world. Uh, so one thing that we wanted to see, if, if we are able just looking at the system profile to detect which cloud provider is hosting the test. So the classes in this case are 10, because there are 10 different that are, pr oh, sorry, providing resources. So we use similar setup, the data set is the same, uh, same type of uh, hyperparameters there. And we ran, again, we used a resolution of one minute, the same features. Um, the loss converges, but the accuracy we got was 0 0.6, which is not really good. Not good enough, definitely. So we went back to doing different experiments. Again, we tried different combination, and we tried, okay, let's, let's put more data in it. Maybe we need more system features, and we added like the memory, we, added, we tried even with this IO, but there was no significant imp improvement in the accuracy. The top value there is dot zero dot six uh, of the one minus uh, accuracy. So it's not, uh, sorry, the bottom one is zero dot four, so which again is the zero dot six accuracy. So we said, well, maybe we are downsampling too much. So we tried changing the resolution. We tried 10 seconds, 30 seconds. Maybe we tried even downsampling more, going to one minute and 10 minutes. But again, the best we could get was not very good with slightly improvement here, going down to 10 seconds, but it's not really significant. We tried changing the hyperparameters. Maybe we need a more complex or a more simple, a simpler, uh, network there, so it turns out that actually using three layers instead of five layers is slightly better. Um, we got 0, 0.668, 6, 6, but still not, not really useful. We couldn't really do a good prediction there. So uh, what changed the thing was actually going back to the data, and this is one of the key uh, outcome of the work that we have done, and uh, a good takeaway is that is the, the data is really important, so you should know your data and should look at your data and understand what is going on as much as possible. Um, so, as I was said, I said before, we had 10 classes, um, but it turns out that some of these classes were actually, could be converged because we had several regions from the same cloud provider. So, for example, um, OVH at two different regions and another cloud provider at three different regions. So, we thought, well, maybe because uh, they are the same cloud provider, even if they're in different geographies, they will use a similar type of setup, uh, they will use similar hardware, so maybe we can collapse them into a single class. In this way, we reduced classes uh, to six, and we tried running our experiments again, and what we saw is that the accuracy was uh, increasing dramatically. So we managed to achieve uh, 0 0.9 as an accuracy. 
So basically, the, the, the takeaway from here, here was that we were trying to separate things that were actually not, not possible to separate because they're very similar. So we had, and, and so there was, and that's why we couldn't get a good accuracy because it was kind of random for the model whether to detect that a certain test ran in region A or region B for a certain cloud provider. So we did some extra tuning, uh, we tried different net network topologies and we managed to get to 0 0.925 in terms of accuracy. Uh, with a one minute resolution and again using a CPU and a system average. We tried again uh, then doing this for the multi-class uh, applying to a different um, CI job. So we use the same similar setup as before, uh, but this time it didn't work really that well. So the best accuracy we could get doing this kind of training with one CI job and evaluation with a different CI job um, was around 0 0.77, so not, not really good. And also the, the average loss and the loss increased very much. So to summarize uh, with the multi-class multi example, again, we had the this user CPU and the uh, one minute load average was the best selection in terms of features from the DSAT data to use to uh, predict uh, this. So it's an interesting takeaway that just looking at the CPU and the system average load every, um, every minute on a system, you can actually identify what is the under underlying cloud provider that is providing the VM. So this looks, we, it, it makes us think that this could be used maybe in future for doing things like creating specific benchmarks that could be then applied to different uh, cloud providers and see, you know, recognize uh, different type of issues in there. So to conclude, I not sure how we're doing the time, but yeah. Um, so to conclude, as I was saying, um, the key takeaway, uh, collect data. You need a data set, and even if there is a lot of open source software, I think a big challenge will be open source data. And a lot of data, a lot of companies have a lot of closer da closed source data. The good thing with large open source communities that they have this ability to produce a lot of uh, data which is open source, the data itself available for everyone and you can actually use that to uh, r um, run machine learning experiments. The other thing is you need uh, domain specific knowledge on the data that you're using. If you um, are a lawyer and you try to do a machine learning project uh, for something related to accounting, you probably won't work. So in, for, in our case, we worked for several years um, on tuning uh, the QA and CI system and reading logs for, uh, for OpenStack, so we knew the data, so that was uh, why it was a good fit. Uh, I strongly recommend, I mean, in our case, uh, for, because it's just a simple neural network that we used, um, it worked well just running on CPU, so we, did, we tried running on GPU, but we didn't see a very much improvement. But nonetheless, you, uh, we recommend work with cloud tools, run your training on the cloud. There are several ways uh, you can do that, but you don't want to have uh, a dependency like you start your training on your laptop and then battery runs out or you have to go somewhere. You, you want to have this running in the cloud and you, have, you want to have uh, repeatable experiments and the ability to collect the data and, and have it on the cloud. Especially because if it's just, just you, but maybe then some other colleagues or some friend joining the project and you want to share data and collaborate. So if you have, it, uh, uh, if you have everything set up in the cloud, it makes things much, much easier. And um, also, well, we were able to confirm that the system load plays a role in the failures. Of course, with the binary classification, we actually um, got the information about that system is uh, the tests have failed or they're passed, which we know already, uh, but uh, you get a, a level of confidence as well with the prediction. So in future, we think uh, we could use this uh, confidence um, level that you can get about the, the failure of the test to 
built a system that allows you to see that a test, even if it's reported as passed, um, it's not identified as passed with high confidence by the system, which might means, uh, which might able, which might let you that, uh, detect early that the si something is going wrong. So situation, real life situation we had with the CI system is that uh, patch after patch, maybe some tests are added which add race condition, uh, maybe the performance in one of the services degrades so it starts using more memory unnecessarily or simply there are more services. So the CI jobs quality or it slightly degrades over time until it gets to a point where uh, the failure rate for uh, tests that should actually pass becomes too high so it's not good anymore for a CI system because it, it brings you a very bad developer experience. So having the, uh, this kind of confidence uh, evaluation whether um, the test is passed or failed may be, may be used to detect that something is getting worse in, in your test system, right? So that you can pr use this to predict that something is going wrong, in the wrong direction. Um, other future work that we might do uh, is to look at uh, using similar techniques for other type of data, like the logs from application, for instance. Um, for other features, uh, we could um, look at predicting other things, like the type of failure that happened. The difficult bit with that is that you really uh, ne then need a human created data set. So basically, if you have engineers that usually look at the logs and they say, oh, well, this failed, yes, but it failed because, um, I don't know, client provider X had an outage or because uh, there was a, a network issue somewhere. So you could use this information, start collecting this information and label your experiment with this information and then you could use this to train uh, in a similar way a model to detect the type of failure. But this requires a lot of work because you need to connect to collect all this human input basically. Another thing that we thought about uh, for future work is that we could try to define some uh, metric that allows us uh, trying to do clustering on the data. Clustering is uh, interesting, it's very difficult though, but if you manage to find the right metric, you may be able then to display your data in some n-dimensional space or two or three-dimensional space and see um, the specific uh, test runs live in a certain in cluster, in certain areas of the space, and that allows uh, you to identify that this uh, CI job or this data samples, they have something in common. And this allows you basically, it's a way that you can use to automatically build classes without doing the human created uh, data set before. Um, other things that we want to do, explore more for the job portability and um, where if we are able to move forward with uh, getting interesting information maybe from the clustering, we could use this data um, also in the real CI system. So the talk is available on GitHub uh, and the, all the code that we wrote for uh, CML project is also available on GitHub. And if you have any question, uh, there might be some. Um, sorry, could you explain, um, uh, go through again why the, um, that why the prediction of the pass and failure is useful? From what I could tell, the uh, the input uh, data for the, for a prediction is only the load levels, right, um, of uh, of the test being run. Is is that right? Did I miss something? So, um, as it is now, it's information we already have. Yeah. So, in that sense, it's not useful. It's useful in a way, in the sense that it, it proves us that there is information that is embedded in system data ah, that okay. from this um, load profiles, we are able to infer something that is whether the test is passed or fail with a very good accuracy. And so this uh, basically, uh, it was the, the beginning, in the beginning what prompted us to continue and do other kind of experiments and look at the uh, multi-class classification for instance and try to extract more data from this um, uh, load data that we have on the system. That's basically it. I mean, um, 
the other thing that I mentioned, I mean, it's, it's not something that we really tried, but because you can get an estimation of the confidence of the prediction, you could build a system where you get, uh, you can say, well, uh, the system predicts that this is past or fail with a certain level of confidence. And then you can use this confidence level uh, in your CI system to say, well, if I'm running the same test, the same type of CI jobs, and the, the confidence degrades, it means that something is changing in the, in, in the, in the system we are testing. Okay. And so you could use this information as a kind of warning to look in what is going what is going on. It could be that, for instance, the memory utilization of your service has increased, and that changed the load profile. Okay. And that degrades the uh, level of the prediction, the confidence in the prediction. Okay, got it now. Thanks.